Like their patron saint, Sir Thomas More, they try to live their faith daily in the judicial system by defending life, marriage, and religious liberty. And we all know the battle is not getting any easier. We'll get an update on the situation tonight, so please stay with us. Welcome, welcome, and thank you. I'm Father Mitch Packer, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest tonight and his associates have spent many hours defending Christians and their rights and beliefs regarding pro-life issues, the sanctity of marriage, and freedom of religion in venues like small local courts. And they've gone all the way to the United States Supreme Court. And more and more, we are realizing the importance of having Christian legal counsel on our side. So please, tonight, welcome the executive director and legal counsel for the Thomas More Society, Mr. Peter Bring. Peter? Thank you, Father. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Now, you're originally from one of my favorite towns, Nashville, Tennessee. Right. I, I was born and then uh, born and raised there and then at about age 10 moved up to the suburbs of Chicago. And now you live up in Chicago. Yes. Uh, uh, you and your wife. Right. Out in a, a suburb uh, called Lombard. Where right. I, serve as a, I also serve as a village trustee. A oh, wonder, there are you. Wonderful town. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, I know Lombard. Uh, not real well. I'm, I'm a city rat, but, you know, I, I try to get out to the country rats now and again. Um, you are working with the, the St. Thomas More Society. What is the St. Thomas More Society? We are a, an actual litigating law firm. We work to defend life, marriage, and religious liberty across the country in courts, whether state courts, federal courts, the lowest courts in the land, all the way up to the top court, the U.S. Supreme Court. And what we do is, I look at it this way, like in the Super Bowl, uh, you don't look at, uh, they didn't interview uh, Eli Manning's offensive line. We're like that offensive line. We're not the star of the show. Uh, folks like Lila Rose and David B. Wright are the star of the show with 40 Days for Life. Or Who's David action. B. Wright? David B. Wright is the head of 40 Days for Life. So he was the one that started the nationwide clinic prayer vigils at, at hundreds of abortion facilities around this country and now across the world. So he's the star quarterback and he's, or, or he's the star running back. We're the offensive line pushing back and ensuring that the government, that Planned Parenthood, and the ACLU can't take out our quarterback. All right. All right. So this is a, a, a great role that you have um, for protecting those who are you know, trying to make a difference in the issues of life, family, and freedom of religion. That, that would be your role. That's us. And, All right. Right. Now... What are some of the cases that you have done? Because you've really been involved in a wide variety of cases. Tell us a little bit about the kind of work that you're doing. Sure. The most recent case that I, I was out in Denver uh, defending the leading pro-life activist in uh, the Denver area. He's an evangelical Christian. He is a regular prayer vigil participant and also a sidewalk counselor. So someone who offers assistance and material assistance and other assistance to women going into the abortion facility in Denver. It's a Planned Parenthood, second largest abortion facility in the country. He was being targeted by the Obama administration and its Department of Justice. Uh, over the last three years, they've worked, the Obama administration has worked with the Planned Parenthood there locally to build a case against this man named Ken Scott. And they had five lawyers on the case. They had filed uh, 10 separate incidents of face violations. We call them the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act violations. So they came at him in federal court with everything they had. Uh, again, five attorneys from your tax dollars uh, paid. 
and we were able to defend him. Most recently, we got a great ruling from the judge who said that the government did not have a case. Uh, but that was something that uh, was, a, we won that case at great cost, at great time, uh, and, and uh, to great, great harm to those who are pro-life in the Denver community. How it was really it harmful them. to the people who are pro-life in the Denver community? Well, look at it this way. Uh, if the federal government comes to your door and says, uh, Father Mitch, we think that what you're doing, peaceful activity on the public sidewalk, is a federal crime for which you should serve one year in the penitentiary, in a federal penitentiary, and pay a $10,000 fine, uh, that's going to dissuade you, even though you may have me coming over and saying, well, you know what, I think you're okay. You know, we're, we're, we're on solid legal footing. That's going to dissuade you, and it's going to dissuade a lot of folks. I mean, anybody, so, even the strongest pro-life person. So as we say in Chicago, they're, they're putting a little muscle on you. Well, is that, what the, that, is that what the Obama administration is trying to do to these people? It, it is absolutely. And, it, you know, we, it's now become known to, the, to folks across the nation as the Chicago way. We just know it as how we do business there. Yes. Um, yes. Yes, 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 and, yes. And so that it, is, it is providential that we were planted in Chicago, and that was where we were founded and, and, and rose up. Because um, you know, even though we are a national law firm, we're all over the place, we have had a lot of cases in Illinois lately just trying to uh, you know, work in that, the most corrupt state in our country. You think it's the most corrupt? It, it's been ranked and officially declared the most corrupt. I mean, we've got four, wow. four governors in prison. I mean, my goodness. Oh, that's or, true. You know, four, I, I uh, forgot <laughs> that we have a, uh, a governor's wing at the state penitentiary. Right. You know, so, yeah, I forgot about that. I mean, that, we've got yeah. Louisiana doubled. Oh, really? Louisiana, we doubled them up. I mean, they only had two. Okay. You know, this is an odd thing for us Illinoisians to be proud of <laughs> or to, to brag on. But it's not really a source right. of bragging because governmental corruption is wrong. And we're, we're not, we're sort of joking around a little sure. bit about it, but you know, it's, it's a wrong thing. And what's really all, also wrong and affects a, a lot of people is that sometimes government tries to use its muscle to muzzle us. And you know, this is one of the things that is uh, a big problem that you're trying to deal with. Absolutely, and, and one of the most recent cases that we were involved in, and it was not a case that came out the way we wanted it to, was defending the Catholic bishops of the state of Illinois. What did they do wrong? Well, they didn't do anything wrong, but the Illinois General Assembly brought these things called civil unions, which are same-sex relationships, which are being recognized by, by the government now as, as a union. Uh, when the bill was passed by the Illinois General Assembly, it included a strong religious protection in it. The bishops thought, even though they were opposed to this bill, said, well, okay, at least we're going to be able to maintain our foster care, our adoption services, which we've, we founded in the state of Illinois. We've been doing for 90 years. The governor thought otherwise, and he said, no, 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 I don't want to let you, Catholic Church, be a part of that. And so... Uh, they, they don't you know, want the Catholic Church to be part of adoption services. Well, that was his main point, adoption and foster care. There's and a foster lot, care. A lot tens of thousands of children are being cared for. These are neglected, abused, abandoned I kids. Know it. I uh, know it. In the worst circumstances. And the Catholic Charities of the state of Illinois had over 2,000 of these children. And that would, if they were their own state, just the Catholic Charity system, they'd be larger than 15 states' foster care systems in their entirety. So this was a huge, huge undertaking that the church had, had been a part of, and again, was 90 years of history doing this. But the governor said, well, I don't want you involved in this. And so uh, there were the brave bishops of Illinois, they had two options, go quietly or stand and fight. And they stood and fought. And uh, they, they asked us to go to court and to seek a declaratory judgment to, uh, to try to get it declared by the court that, hey, we have a religious right to do this. And at the end of the day, uh, we were up on appeal. Uh, we had a good ruling in the trial court, then we had a bad ruling. We're up on appeal and the governor of Illinois said, I'm taking the kids from you, so I'm going to moot the case before the appellate court in Illinois has a chance to decide it. That is an exercise of raw government power of the executive branch. One could almost, when you talk about raw government power, you start to hear the word dictatorship ringing in your ears. Well, and, and it, it's, it's something that... Uh, you know, I serve as an elected official. I mean, I'm a very small elected official, but it's something where you, you know that you have got to exercise government power very, very carefully.
because it can be so overwhelming for people. And we see this all across the country. The Illinois example is one that was very acute. And I, I, I bring that up, not because I want to bring up a loss, but because that, I believe that loss is now, we're seeing the benefits of it. Because as you see, with the new things going on out of Washington, the bishops know what's coming because they've seen it in Illinois, they've seen it in other places, and they know that they need to stand and fight. So in Illinois, the bishops lost any chance to do foster care anymore? That unfortunately was what happened. Mm -hmm. And again, they were, they were forced out. Uh, it was to the point where uh, we were up on appeal and the, appeal, the appellate court set a timetable for the briefing. And this, the governor of Illinois said, I'm taking the kids away before you can even get the case filed and briefed in front of the appellate court. I'm gonna take away from the judges the ability to even hear your legal claim. You are not going to get your day in court. That's what the governor of Illinois did. Mm -hmm. so, so then that is the end of it and they, they can't do anything else about it? In that particular case, yes. But what that did was that taught. It was a great teaching moment for our bishops. And, and our bishops stood up and were, uh, they were wonderful. They stood strong, they stood for the faith, and they, they did the sorts of things that kind of, it was like the early persecutions of the church. You know what, you, you take a hit and you know how to come back the next time. And you really, you strengthen yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so now when, we, when you see this united response of the bishops to the, uh, the, the problems coming out of Washington, the bishops in Illinois know exactly what's going on and they've been right at the head of things. Let's, let's take a look uh, because this is a hot issue right now. The Department of Health and Human Services, headed by Kathleen Sibelius, has come after the church in a certain way, saying that we may not follow our conscience in not paying for the uh, health care programs that include sterilization, by which people will no longer be able to have children, birth control, which stops the, the, the birth of children in a temporary basis, and then uh, abortifacients, uh, that, you know, chemical abortifacients, which would stop a life that was conceived if the other two didn't work. Uh, and that the bishops are trying to say, we cannot and will not do it. Would I have the case basically correct? That is, that is an accurate statement of the case. And, and it is, it is as dire as you've put it. It would be forcing Catholics to absolutely abandon their conscience. And really the, the, the overall move here, and you, you could see this in, in many of our cases, it's trying to get Catholics and Christians out of the public square, to get the expression of your faith back behind the church doors. Uh, I mean, think about it. When, when a pro-life individual is out on the sidewalk offering assistance to a woman in need, they want him to get away go away, go back to your church. When Catholic Charities is out offering material assistance to the poor, they say, you know what, we don't mind the material assistance, we just don't like the Catholic part. Take that back to your church. And so this is yet another step in that. But again, I, I see very promising signs here. I think our, our bishops are very much aware of what the stakes are and they are moving forward very strongly. My sense, you know, uh, Archbishop uh, Timothy Dolan of New York has been one of the leaders. As I understand it, he had met with President Obama in the Oval Office and had been promised that there would be exemptions for Catholic conscience on the health care proposals. Is that correct? Well, I, I can't speak for the Archbishop. I mean, that, that seems to comport with everything the President had said until these regulations were put forth. You go back to the talk at Notre Dame that he gave, a great controversy. Uh, we represented the ND88, those who had been arrested during peaceful civil disobedience, uh, arrested for trespass and charged there. Um, you know, we were able to successfully end that case. But the president at Notre Dame promised that he would respect our religious consciences. And now you see what actually happened. He's, he's not telling, he's not sticking with what he said. He said that at Notre Dame, but now he's not doing that. Uh, when it comes down to the health care bill. He got, he, got his, he got his picture in, in my beloved blue and gold and then turned around. You're a Notre Dame grad? I am a proud Notre Dame law grad. There you go. There you go. And, um, you know, one of the things that, you know, I wonder, again, I'm not a lawyer, 
but I like to read the Constitution. As a matter of fact, one of the things I, I like to ask lawyers, this is a little oh, trick wow. question. Okay. When you were in law, first year law school, you took constitutional law class, correct? Well, second year. Second yeah. year. Okay, took right. it in second year. Okay. All right. Did your professor require you to read the document of the Constitution itself? I think he did, but, but I, don't sure. I don't recall because I, had, I keep my own copy handy at all times. Right, right, so right. So right, I had right. read it many times myself. So I'd Your answer is the standard answer I get from all but three lawyers I've talked to. Okay. I've come across three lawyers whose professors did require them to read the Constitution in the constitutional law class. It was just very interesting. I mean, what, and uh, people don't realize that. Uh, back in the uh, uh, World War I and post-World War I period, Harvard Law School stopped the practice of reading the Constitution and Con Law class. And they only read c cases. That's what I'm sure you mostly spent your time on was cases. Well, we, we did now, but I was at Notre Dame, which is the right. one law school in the top 25 where you could talk about issues of faith or natural law or what have mm -hmm. you and not be laughed out of the classroom. Right. And right. again, I hope there are more schools now in the top 25 that have that same uh, attitude. God willing. God but, willing. But, but we had that when I was there. So, I mean, I, I don't want to... Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, we, we had some we had some I'm just talking about the so. Constitution, and this is one okay. of the things, because a lot of people are very confused. They think that the Constitution says that there's a separation of church and state. Is that in the Constitution? No, absolutely not. No. Fact, what is there? Well, that was a response of Thomas Jefferson to the, uh, the Baptists, who were worried not about... Uh, yeah, they were worried about government infringing on them, not about the church infringing on the government. So really, uh, this, this separation, the wall of separation, is something to hold back the government power so that it not get to the point of being the raw power that it has now expanded to today and now is in the, the Obama administration and others, uh, allies throughout the states, are trying to expand it in that way. So that, that it, the wall of separation should be protecting us right now, not constraining us. And that's exactly what we need at this stage, because what the Constitution says is that Congress shall not establish a religion, nor shall it infringe on the practice thereof. You know, the, the, there's yeah. no, they, they can't interfere in the practice. And it's my recollection that Thomas Jefferson actually allowed church services to occur in the House of Representatives while he was president. Absolutely. So the guy who coined the phrase had church services occurring in our government buildings, the right. House of Representatives That's exactly itself. right. That's exactly right. Church services were held, there were Protestant services held every Sunday in the Capitol building. Yeah. You know, so, so that he didn't see the, the separation of church and state going the other way so much as protecting religion from the state. Absolutely. And that, I mean, that is some of the work that we do at Thomas More. And, and again, I go back to that offensive lineman uh, theory. We're there to protect and to ensure that the government doesn't come in against some of the wonderful people that are doing the work, that are winning the fight on some of our issues here today. Well, the reason I bring this up, as a lawyer who understands these things better than I do, I would wonder if there are grounds of saying, you know, well, the, the, the Constitution says Congress may not establish a religion or infringe on it. Would that also be applicable to the executive branch, the president and his cabinet? Would they have a right to infringe on religious practice according to the Constitution? Well, at least, and, and I... I mean, let's, let's do it looking at the way we interpret the Constitution today. The executive branch does not have that authority. If Congress didn't have it, the executive branch certainly doesn't right. have it today. And it's something that, I mean, we need to, we need to understand that that is supposed to protect us. I mean, that, that First Amendment is, is really, I mean, that, that's our key rights, a set of rights here. And uh, to lose that is, I mean, well, I, there are folks who are trying to help us lose it or trying to put us to losing it. Uh, but again, that, that's something we've got to fight for. Well, see, one, one of the theories of, of constitutional law that, uh, that seems to be going on in conflict with us is that some people don't like the Constitution 
because it protects the individual from the government. And there are other people who want to protect the government from the individual. You know, that they're, they're, they, they want the individual to be subservient to the government, whereas the Constitution, as it's written, protects the individual from the government. Would that be relatively accurate? Absolutely. It, the reason you have a Constitution is to set down and ensure that the government is kept within certain walls, that they, you know, this far and no farther. And so that is something that is, but, but that is a debate, and that is something that you're having to re-educate our American people about right. today. Because we, you know, maybe, maybe call it a lack of civics, call it uh, modern media or what have you, that folks have maybe forgotten those truths. Mm -hmm. That the Constitution is there to set the outer boundaries. And I will say this, um, there is something to be said for electing good legislators and executive branch officials. Because uh, a good legislator, a good executive branch official, doesn't get near those walls. You see those as healthy boundaries. We shouldn't have to sit there and test, where is the boundary of the First Amendment on freedom of religion? No, because the legislators should stay well clear of those boundaries. They should understand, hey, I'm getting close to dangerous waters here. This is not something where I'm gonna fight for every inch I can get. I'm gonna stand back and respect the constitutional rights. Even though no court may have said, well, you have a specific right to do this or that. Well, why even go that far? Let's not get near those danger zones. That's what a principled legislator does. And that's what a principled executive branch official should be doing. But see, what we see is that they are pushing the edge. They're, they're having the federal government push against the rights of conscience that inherently belong to each individual. And that's what's going on with this health and human services issue, that they are pushing against the rights of each individual, in this case, all the Catholic bishops and all the people who work in Catholic institutions to follow the conscience that belongs to them inherently as a gift from God. And, and let's not forget Catholic business people and evangelical Christian business people and other people of goodwill who, of any denomination who are now being forced to do things that are against their conscience, to fund things that are against their conscience. What in the world happened to our country uh, and, and so we've got to step back, and, and it's not just in the freedom of conscience, it's everywhere that is covered by the First Amendment. In the free speech area, you see uh, Mayor Rahm Emanuel passing new ordinances in Chicago trying to constrain freedom of speech. You see that all well, over the country. Why is he trying to re restrain freedom of speech? Well, it's interesting. We've, what, do they have something on them? Well, you know what, we, we've got the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the big summits uh, coming up, the World Economic Summits are coming to Chicago. And so the other side, you know, the, the, the other side on this has said, well, we're bringing 50,000 people in to protest. And I'm sitting there thinking, well, the March for Life is 400,000, and we usually do fine. We don't need extra laws passed in Washington, D.C. to get this done. But so Mayor Emanuel, in, under the guise of controlling the large crowd coming into town, he's, he, he proposed this long ordinance, most of which is reasonable. Okay, well, fine, you know, you know stand here, don't stand there. Uh, you know, you've got a 50,000-person crowd, so you need to control it a little bit. But then tacked onto the end of the ordinance, numerous restrictions on small group picketing, which really mostly will apply to the abortion facilities in the city of Chicago. It may even apply to the union members of the city of Chicago. Because I, I like to talk, you know, we, we talk about it not, you know, this isn't a political movement that we're talking about here. We're talking about the First Amendment. We should all have that right to free speech. Whether you want to protest as a Tea Party member on a, or on our issues as a pro-life person, as a union member, what have you, immigration, whatever. It's a free country. All of those rights within the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, all of those are being constrained by the government today. And there's, there's, there's a thread running through that. And again, we may not think of it that way sometimes, but that's how we look at it. But see, this is one of the things that we must think about. Um, uh, one of the things I encourage people to do, and I do myself, I, I, I'm asking other people to do what I practice, which is, to read the Constitution every so often, at least the Bill of Rights. But it's not bad to read the rest of it, too, because it, it, you find out what the federal government is supposed to do. It's a wonderful document, not a novel, but it's a, it's a wonderful document, and we should read that to know what our rights are over against the government and that especially as the government is taking moves to infringe on those rights. 
And, and the way I, I, I fully agree with you, Father, and I, and I look at it this way, something like the First Amendment, our freedom of speech, our freedom of religion, it's like a muscle. If you don't exercise it, it grows flabby. Mm -hmm. That's I tell folks that. I say, look, exercise this muscle. Uh, our forefathers fought and died for this. I mean, we fought multiple wars for this, both on, on our soil and, and abroad. Let's exercise our rights. If you're not involved in the political process, if you're not involved in some sort of public witness for your, for your faith uh, and for your beliefs, get out there and do something. If you're homebound, you pray, you send letters, you can make phone calls, you can do a lot of things. And, and I think all of us, uh, and, and now with this HHS uh, regulation, the Health and Human Services regulation, we've all been made acutely aware uh, that we are going to have to be active. Yeah, this is not just applying to some fringe group anymore. We Catholics are nearly 25% of the population, and our conscience is being told that it means nothing, and our conscience is being trampled on. As a matter of fact, in the military, the archbishop of the military sent a letter to his priests to be read about the HHS uh, uh, controversy. And they were forbidden their exercise of speech to read that letter until changes were made in it. You know, so this is yeah. uh, a problem. And, and this is something, I mean, uh, we're a military family. I mean, I, we have relatives at Fort Bragg right now who are in the Army and who, who want to hear this message, who need to hear this message. And to have the government think that they can tell a priest what to do from the pulpit. Exactly. It's a frightening, frightening uh, thought and, and a place to be. So again, this is something where we are pushing back, but everyone in America, I mean, if, if, if you, you know you need to get active. I mean, we're in a primary season, so everybody thinks elections. It's not just elections, there are also issues. Exactly. But, you know, I mean, I, I encourage everybody, and, and we as a, as a 501c3, we don't, we're not in partisan politics, but I can still tell everyone to get out and find the right candidate, volunteer for that candidate, do everything you can for that candidate. Right. Move the process forward. And it, but, but and before you do, when you say find the right candidate, you know, one of the things that that includes is examining what are that candidate's positions on various moral issues. We don't want to think, well, what am I going to get from the candidate if he does this? You know, we have to examine the moral questions. I just called my congressman today. You know, he's in Washington, so I got his office here in, in Birmingham. But, you know, I, I called him about the HHS issue and explained to him that Catholics are not fighting this because we just invented a new doctrine. We have been against abortion and birth control since the first century. It's in the Didache that these are forbidden to us. And we may not change our doctrine. This is not a new issue that we're just dealing with because of partisan politics. It is our issue from the beginning of the church for 1900 years. A absolutely. And, and we, we need to, though, when you, you, you hit on something when you're talking about the politicians, which is I'm not looking for what I can get out of them. And I might say you are looking for what you can get out of them. OK, go ahead. And because you're looking for good government out of them. You're yes. looking for morals out of them. You are looking for a particular set of values out of that person. And, and you know what? You can work with politicians who don't agree with you on many things, but you want to make sure that they understand, hey, we care very much about this and we want you to back us up on this. And I often see just watching legislatures and working with legislators. You don't need every member of the legislator, le legislature to be on fire for your issues. You need a couple people to be on fire and you need a whole army of people who are willing to vote when the thing gets called. Right. So as long as you can get that done, Good things can happen. And the other side understands that. I think we understand it now and we're working towards it. But I mean, that, that is how I look at that issue with politics. Sure. And it That's is a very a good pragmatic point. look. Good point. That is a pragmatic look because politics, uh, and maybe you say it's, a, it's an art, not a science. You know, theology, philosophy, those are sciences. There are very specific principles and you, you, you know, certain things that you just don't break. In politics, it's the art of the possible. And you're trying to get the pro life position out. You've got to see what can you get and you move it forward. Right. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to come up on a presidential election. The Lord is not running as one of the candidates. We can't vote for him. We have to vote for a human being. So you see, well, who, who's going to help advance the ball the most? Who, can, who will protect my rights, my conscience? Who will help our country? 
grow, go forward, get better, you know, improve the economy, but then also respect the moral foundations that the whole country was founded on. Yeah. All right, we have to take a break. Uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes. We want to get questions from our studio audience and from you. So please stay with us. I want to just give you some information that the uh, Thomas More Society can be reached at 312-782-1680. That's 312-782-1680. And they also have a website, which is www.thomasmoresociety.org. And you can find out more about what they're doing and the kind of cases that they have and uh, various ways you can give them your support. Uh, they would appreciate that, I'm sure. Also want to remind you, uh, if you have a chance to come here on pilgrimage, please do so. We'd love to have you as part of our studio audience and be able to ask questions, come here to the masses, do tours of the studios, all that. Contact our pilgrimage department at 205 271 2966. Or you can also go to www.ewtn.com and they'll help you with all sorts of information that you might need if you get, come here on pilgrimage. And uh, by the way, Peter, have you noticed how many flowers are already blossoming? That, uh, I actually posted that on Facebook earlier today. I took a picture of one of the flowers because, of course, we came in from Chicago where we're not going to see flowers for a while. Right. I put it on Facebook and said, I'm in Birmingham and my goodness, there are flowers blooming. I couldn't believe it. Yep, whole cheese full. So come on down. You ready for some questions? Absolutely. All right, let's go to Mary, first of all. Hello, Mary. Hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? Florida. And what's your question? Okay, when we do sidewalk counseling, um, the police come out, the sheriff's department, they put up that yellow uh, crime scene tape. They put up cameras. They stay there. But anyway, we have Planned Parenthood people coming out trying to incite us to cross over the line so they can arrest us. Now, how do we get to the girls? We can't talk to them. And some of these girls going in there, they're like 12 and 13, 14. Oof. You know, and it's like we can't get to them. Okay. You, Peter? All right. Well, and, and, and without knowing the... Uh, dynamics of the particular facility, uh, it, it was always struck me that the more the police react to our message, to the message of those who are out there, the message of assistance, uh, the better it actually is for uh, the folks who are there. Because when, you, uh, when there is a large police presence at an abortion facility, oftentimes people get scared and not go in. It's kind of an interesting uh, way of looking at things. But when you're looking at the police particularly, uh, Really, there are various methods to, uh, to deal with that, but one of, number one is to call us. So I would invite Mary to give us a call first off so that we can really analyze and her by situation. by you mean at the Thomas More Society? Thomas More Society. And in fact, we have a new the, new, the website is brand new. We've just redone it. So you can go through the website now as well to get legal help. Uh, so again, thomasmoresociety.org. Um, but that's really the place to, for, that we can analyze because you, you have certain rights on the public right of way. But there are times, I mean, look, you know, there's private property, and you have to respect the private property. And if the police are just defending the private property with, it sounds like just means that are uh, really overkill, uh, I mean, that, they can do that. 
Uh, at the same time, uh, it's really, again, I, I, it's been my personal experience, I understand, that when there's more police presence, that reduces the number of people who want to go into the abortion facility because they think, well, there's something wrong here. And maybe, as well, folks are going and that might you know, cause them to pause and say, gee, why, why are there so many police officers here? Maybe there's something wrong with this place. Another thing, too, um, I had a guest on a couple weeks ago who brought up a very important uh, tactic. You know, we may be prevented from stopping the girls from going in, but they also need care after they've been there. And sometimes it's good to have people at the back door to help counsel some of those girls who have already had the abortion. And this might be a way to, to start a relationship with them as well. It's too late for the baby, uh, but sometimes we can't, they, they don't let us in. Well, and, and it, from what I've been told, I mean, just from representing clients, there's also, there, folks will go to abortion facilities also to get, uh, they may start multi-day abortion procedures. They may be getting some sort of contraception. So there may not have actually been an abortion that was that was done on that day. So right. folks coming out, you don't even know. You might you might still have a, uh, if you're looking, you know, if you think that this woman is pregnant, there may still be an opportunity to reach right. out to that woman for, right. for a pre-abortion consult. But again, after abortion care is something that the Christian community offers that often is not offered no. by abortion facilities. No. And so that is that is a very As a matter of fact, typically yeah. is not offered. They don't right. care once that you've had the abortion. They don't care. You know, so, you know, that's we, we can we can at least minister there and that can help prevent another abortion from occurring for some people who have multiple abortions. We can stop that. Well, and you know, before I became, before I joined the Thomas More Society, I actually founded two pregnancy centers in the western suburbs of Chicago. And we found that up, up to 50% of the women we saw who were at risk for another abortion, they had had a previous abortion. They were at risk for abortion. 50% had had a prior abortion. So it's something that tends to repeat itself. So reaching right. out to folks after they've had an abortion, right. maybe at a point where they, they maybe understand the magnitude of what has gone on with a message of help hope and caring. Yeah, yeah, you love them. It's very you important. Love them. Yeah. All right, let's go to a studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? Uh, Chicago. Great. And what's your question? Um, from a legal perspective, do you think we could ever ban abortion in this country? Interesting question. And, and I, the answer is yes, we can. Let, let's, let's look at it this way. The country is now more pro-life than it has been since Roe v. Wade. You're looking at 51, 52 percent of people self-identifying as pro-life. Independent uh, surveys will show that the majority of Americans, a solid majority, are in favor of restricting abortion to cases of rape, incest, and the life of the mother. That's that, you know, the tagline that we don't like. At the same time, it covers, you know, that, that percentage is something like one or two percent of all abortions. So you yeah, it's not yeah. it's not the elective abortions where I wanted a girl and I'm getting a boy or vice versa. Or I've, I've got all. prom coming up or right, what have you. Right, right, right. right. Or, or I mean, you know, and, and more serious reasons. But at the same time, it's it's not what um, Americans would consider to be. You know, those those are not what Americans would consider to be the typical elective uh, or even you know birth control abortions, if you will. So if we can get rid of 99, 98 percent of abortions in the country. Well, then I think we could have a very healthy debate about one or two percent. And then you could really work to get resources to help women who are in need to ensure that you would then get that rate down to zero. Right. And then, you, you know, again, you, 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 um, and when you're eating an elephant, you don't bite it whole hog. No. At the same time, you know, I, I, and I want to say this. Cut it in strips. Well, and you know what? There are a lot of folks who have a lot of different opinions on how we should go about that business of restricting abortion or banning abortion. I, I'm a big believer in free market. So try it all. See right. what works. What do the people, the American people, want? Give that to them. So let's get that. And, you know, so, so again, you know, there's, there's various movements out there legally. I'm in support of, hey, whatever we can make work. Again, politics is more pragmatic. So let's see what we can get to work. Okay. I have another caller. Hello, Ken. Yeah. Uh, Father, Hi, Ken. Uh, Where are you from? I'm from North Carolina. Great. And what is your question? Okay, I, I, I know quite a few Muslims uh, in the past years, and the uh, thing on abortion and birth control came up a number of times. And they informed me that 
in their religion and in, in their countries that it was against uh, their principles and uh, for anyone to have an abortion. And in fact, it is a capital offense in some countries. Uh, why isn't the Obama administration pursuing Muslims as much as he's pursuing the Catholic Church? Very good question. Well, and, and these regulations do, they apply to Muslims, yep. to uh, Catholics, to Evangelical Christians, Jews. to Orthodox Jews, to all, all sorts of folks. And, and again, atheists who don't believe in abortion. I mean, you know, the, there's a, I think there's a strong movement of atheist pro-life people because if you think that this is it, you're really going to be pro-life, you would, you would imagine. I mean, you don't, right. you know, uh, and so, I mean, I don't mean to be flip about it, but it, it um, this is something that is so pernicious. It is going across all, I mean, this should cross all faith boundaries. And I, again, I hope that maybe this is a moment when we can come together uh, as various faiths that can come together, both within our own faith, the Catholic faith, but then come together to show as Americans, we don't believe in this. And whether that means you vote a particular way in the next election, it also means maybe you're demonstrating, maybe you're calling your congressman. Uh, we need to get together and work on this. As a matter of fact, um, th there are two other issues. One, you know, Catholics run, I think it's nearly 25% of all hospitals in the country. Muslims do not. And that's one of the issues at stake here, that will, you know, you know th there's not as large a Muslim school system as there is a Catholic school system. There is not as large a Muslim a charitable system as there is a Catholic system. So they're going after us because there's a lot more at stake than there is with the Muslims. However, already three imams in three different cities have said that they will take it to the streets if they try to force us to have abortion, uh, sterilization, and contraception. So that they, they themselves are ready to take this to the streets and we should look to their courage as a, as a good model for our own courage as well. I, absolutely. I, I think when you look at the number of people who are impacted by these proposed regulations and now you know, they're gonna, they're, they have the force of law as of particular dates, uh, I think we'd make the Occupy movement you know, look like a, a Cub Scout troop uh, with the number of people that we could put on the street and really who are passionate about this. And I think we, if, if the efforts aren't being undertaken now, then they ought to be undertaken. That's, yep. that's not necessarily for us, it's the Thomas More Society, because we're, we're lawyers in court. But I, I do hope those efforts are being undertaken. Yep. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? From South Africa. South Africa. You win the Long Distance Award tonight. Uh, what is uh, your question? Just interested to hear um, if the Society uh, of St. Thomas More is represented outside the U.S. As far as I know, we don't have anything similar in our own country. And that, uh, that's something that we are uh, working on. Uh, and it, it even happens in this country because we're not a, we're not a massive organization. We get around. We, we really do uh, reach out a lot. But uh, we've been active in some cases in Canada. And I, at, at every March for Life, I meet more and more people from outside uh, the U.S. who need legal representation across the world. And so we are beginning to work on those efforts, trying to figure out how do we uh, deal with that problem in other parts of, of the world where, where even the right to free speech is not a, an, a universally acknowledged right. right. I mean, how do you even begin uh, to then start defending folks who want to just stand on a public sidewalk and it might be illegal in their country? Right. So there's some unique issues, but it's something that we, we want to look to look to and work on and maybe uh, you know, even, even shame some other countries into developing a right to free speech. You know, it's, um, uh, that, that would be a very important issue that you'd have to have lawyers who understand the law of very different systems of law. I mean, we use English common law as a basis here. That's not the case in Europe. In fact, it's and, not even the case in England. I mean, no, 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 not in England either. Yeah. So we'd, we'd have to, you know, the lawyers would have to really know all of their own legal system very well to be able to pursue this. Right. And that's something, even in this country, uh, you see a lot of groups of lawyers who get together and have an annual red mass. So that's a great event. It's, a, it's the lawyers' annual mass, lawyers, judges, everybody gets together and have a mass, and maybe they'll have a breakfast or what have you afterward, or, you know, before or after. Um, but then the group disbands for the rest of the year. And maybe they'll have someone come in to be a speaker midway through the year. Right. We're trying to work on 
developing those groups of lawyers to take those lawyers who have litigation skills, who have particular nonprofit organization skills to help when, when we have problems at an abortion facility or when a, a pro-life nonprofit needs to be incorporated or any of the other issues that just come up in everyday life. You know, there's so many legal issues that just come up in America today um, to get those local groups of lawyers to be able to help locally. Uh, that's something that we are working on right now and we've been trying to get going. Um, but again, th because right now, I mean, when, when, when pro-life groups approach us about just setting up things like their nonprofit documents, we work to get them set up and help them out. Sure. And we'll get, you know, and I can point out pro-life organizations all over this country that exist because we were able to get them incorporated and go through the rigmarole and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, get them the resources they needed when they were at their smallest and didn't have any finances to speak of in order to pay for lawyers to do all the filings and things like that. Okay. We have another call on the line. Hello, Joyce. Yes, Father. Hi, where are you from? I'm from North Carolina. And what is your question? Yes, um, I know that um, what I was wondering was um, if the Catholic Church, we, uh, we have a lot of hospitals, and if we would show our muscle by closing down some of these hospitals, by letting them know our strength and all, I mean, I know that would be a bad thing for us here in America, but it's just like we always have, we seem like we have to fight for, you know, our courage and our strength and to show this country, you know, really what the Catholic Church does for people. Yeah, that, I mean, I, I've been thinking about this too. What if we were to close all the Catholic schools next January? Because this, the, the government has given us until next January, the Obama administration has given us until next January to think about how we're going to break our conscience or not. And could we close the hospitals, schools, and other organizations and say, okay, you take it? Well, and, and I, I understand the, um, the appeal yes. immediately of that. Yes. But the problem is, as you, as you walk through things, I'll tell you the, the actual way it would likely happen would be we would just give up those institutions and they would become secular. Right. Or they would become some sort of non-denominational Christian so as not to offend anyone. Uh, and, and really, so, I mean, that, that, as much as it has some appeal viscerally, right. it right. really is kind of a retaliatory action. It's, it's not going to end up that way. And, you right. know, it, it, it hasn't ended up that way where, it's, where similar situations have occurred where Catholic charities have needed to give up certain ministries. Um, it just, it's, it's not pretty. I mean, really, I would say this, you know, we don't have other options. You have to fight back against the regulations. You've got to beat them. Uh, you know, and, and really, there's no, there's no good other way to deal with this in okay. our institutions. Now, here's w one of the other questions I have. If the government continues, and, and the government said, you know, the um, man in charge, the, the press representative from uh, the White House, said that they are not going to rescind these orders, that, that they are committed to doing this. And the bishops are committed to not doing it. So we've got a conflict coming along, and it'll play out in the law in various ways. But if the government continues to insist on forcing us to violate our conscience, would it mean fines that's that would be that's what the law says that there are fines and if the bishops refuse to pay fines would that mean that they would be arrested and go to jail you know i, I have not done investigation on what happens if you don't pay the fines right however i know that just and i think i don't, I don't have to tell you when the federal government has money owed to it it gets the money. They, get the, they, they find ways to get the and, money. And I, I don't know exactly. You know, there was this debate over whether it was a tax uh, earlier. Uh, right. You know, and, and it turned out, under the legal definition, it was a tax. And I, if, it's, if it has anything to do with the IRS, they're going to get their money. Yes. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that the, the present administration is doing is causing a lot more expense by hiring new IRS agents to be able to go after everybody. Sure. All right. Let's uh, go to our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? Fort Worth, Texas, Father. Ain't you some? 
Now, what, what's your question? Uh, my question is, where do these departments like Health and Human Services and the other departments that are created by the government, not by the Constitution, derive their authority to make binding law that circumvents the legislature and the Constitution? And that's a very good question and one that a lot of folks are asking nowadays. Uh, technically, they get their authority uh, through statute, which says, well, uh, you know, the statutes don't give all of the details of how a particular program is to be administered, so they leave a lot of things to these cabinet departments. And you know, in the same way that if you had good cabinet officials with limited jurisdictions, they could do good work. Uh, we've got cabinet officials who do not have limited jurisdictions, who have a, an expansive view of government, don't understand our faith, our principles, or really the, you know, the, some of these, the principles that the country was founded on. Uh, and this, then you get the overreach that you get today. And then you've got to start suing each of these cabinet departments to figure, you know, to, to stop them. You say, well, what you're doing is not supported by the law as passed by Congress. But that's a tough lawsuit to bring. It's a very difficult argument to make because the executive branch is strong in the American system. They're, they're given plenty of leeway to, to execute the laws. And it, it was, in fact, the uh, Congress and Senate that voted the health care bill into existence. So it, it was law that came through legislation and the president signed it. And, and of course, there were promises that we would, uh, as Catholics, would not be forced to, uh, to do abortions. There would not be money going to abortions and things like that. And all of a sudden you turn around and part of the issue here is you're supporting abortions. Um, and again, you know, you want to tie it back to Planned Parenthood. All of these services that you're you're supporting, Planned Parenthood is a big, big, big in favor of. You know, they they want to see uh, the contraceptive coverage free. They want to see uh, the abortifacients free because that will assist them. In well, their business. not free. They want us to pay for it. Oh, right. Not the person who's getting it to pay for it. Right. It it, it will all fall on you, the uh, the person working hard who's getting an insurance benefit. So you're. You know, eventually, you know, we, we don't we don't necessarily see the employer paid part of our insurance premia, but you've worked for it. You've earned it. It's just the employer pays it directly to right. an insurance agency. Uh, so that that is, uh, you know, that you know, we're going to have to deal with this. Uh, mm -hmm. And that I mean, what, again, though, if you have good government, good things can happen. Restrained government, people who have the right ideas and the right principles in play. We don't have that right now. So we're having to fight hard in the courts. We're having to fight hard in these other arenas because these folks who are in the government, I, uh, they don't understand us. And I, I heard Congressman Dan Lipinski on WLS radio this morning talking about that. He said, I talked to the administration folks, and he's a, he's a pro-life Democrat outside of Chicago and covers part of Chicago. And he said, they just don't understand our principles. They don't even get the issue. So you're speaking, the language we speak as Catholic Christians, as people of faith, is totally different than the language of the folks in the White House speak. Yeah, I, I think that they have a, um, a, an attitude that, you know, people who are pro-life are poor, benighted rubes who don't understand. As a matter of fact, there was just... 52% of the country. Pardon? 52 percent of the 52 country. 52 percent of the country. Right. Uh, but they, you know, they don't think. And, and there was just a, a, an article in the Washington Post, I believe, today saying that Catholics don't care about these issues of conscience. So they intend to roll over it because it won't really matter and Catholics won't respond. And that is what they are counting on, is that Catholics won't respond to this. That's absolutely correct. And anybody who's been involved in politics knows. I mean, this is, you know, we talked about the Chicago way earlier. It's about, it's not about what's right or wrong. It's about what can I get? What does my, you know, what are the people who fund me want me to do? And if I can get it, then I'm going to take it. Mm -hmm. You know, constitution, rules, ethics, what have you, out the window. So that's what's occurring here. And so that is, that is the, this is, this is the, the moment, this is the, if you ever watch poker, uh, you know, it's the all-in moment. Um, not that I'm advocating gambling or anything like no, that. No, I don't but think But this is, were. I mean, this is the all-in moment. And they're saying, look, we don't think you, Catholic Church, Christians, people of faith, we don't think you have the ability to stand up and do what you say, uh, to stand up for your faith, to stand up for your principles. And your conscience. And your conscience. 
and to be able to stand up for that effectively and win politically uh, on that issue. I'm afraid we've run out of time. Thank you very much for your time and for being with us. I uh, want to keep our prayers and prayers to St. Uh, Thomas More uh, for your society to continue doing the work. And all of us have to be involved in this great work ourselves, too. This is where we take our role as citizens uh, seriously uh, and our role as Catholics seriously. Well, may Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And again, I want to remind you that this network is brought to you by you. We can only do this program and the other programs we do because of your generosity. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill so that we can pay all of our bills. Thank you.